that these people will be introduced to us, to me at least. I do not know. I yes, we will. Anyone we, before. Yes, yes, yes. We will do as we proceed. Yes, surely, Professor. Welcome, friends, <coughs> from across different parts of the world to this exciting session today. It's a huge honor and privilege for me to welcome Paul St. Thwa from Myanmar, who has been awarded the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize for 2020 for the Asia region for his work on land conservation. Dubbed as the Green Nobel Prize, this award is given annually to environmental heroes from each of the world's six inhabited continents. Paul needs no in introduction. His inspiring movement for environmental and climate justice in Myanmar speaks loads for himself. As we know, Myanmar's political situation has historically posed serious challenges for defenders of human rights and development justice to advance their work. But it is people like Paul who give us hope that pro-people social movements for climate justice and indigenous people's rights that are so central to sustainable development can succeed despite unsurmountable challenges. Our heartfelt congratulations to Paul on his achievements on behalf of all those people who want a fair and just world. I have had the privilege over the last 15 years to visit and closely connect with those working on human rights in Myanmar from Yangon, Mandalay, as well as from Northern Thailand cities closer to the border like Chiang Mai. Before inviting Paul to share his insights on his work, I would request Prafulla Samantra, an environmental justice activist from India and, and recipient of the Global Environmental Prize for 2017 to say a few words. Prafulla Da leads the Lok Shakti Abhiyan and National Alliance of People's Movements in India. I would like him to set the stage before he rushes to attend another pre-scheduled meeting. Over to you, Prafulla Uh, thanks, uh, especially to all of you and special the organizers. And uh, also, uh, we have many friends of, uh, from the other countries and also uh, our friend like Harman from Sri Lanka. We know each other very well since long. <clears throat> and Shandi Pandey uh, is our uh, a friend of uh, struggles uh, in India, and uh, he has arranged this uh, meeting, of course, to welcome our uh, the new uh, awardee Green Lovell uh, Prize winner, uh, Mr. Paul Sain, and uh, on behalf of Friends of India and Activities of India, as well as also a, a co-winner of this uh, Goldman and Mental Prize. Of, 2017 for this year. I welcome to our great friend and fighter and uh, uh, the green activist, the Paul Shane of Myanmar, our neighbor country and friend country also. That uh, I, I again I greet him with all hearty uh, you know, thanks and hearty congratulations, uh, uh, Paul. Is uh, pr uh, proud of ours uh, and uh, in, Del in Asia. So again, I welcome him at also as a new member to Goldman family. Uh, so, so we see that uh, we'll listen to him and very well and what he achieved. But what I know that he has uh, historical contribution uh, recently because uh, he has made uh, a, a peace park on the river uh, <coughs> Salween, uh, which is a very, very important river from China and up to Thailand. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a very, very achievement also because he fought it also, because he could uh, uh, establish, uh, he could establish with his community leadership, with all communities. He could uh, have uh, also established uh, 27 community forests on this peace park, because peace park consists of 
this forest park uh, this is a uh, community forest is and also um, enforcement of fish conservation zones so there because, because it is also related to the livelihoods of the uh, fisher fox and uh, fisherman also also it lead to also food security both the forest and conservation of fish zones this is very very important to, and also to protect the rivers this is very very important how to protect how to conserve the river biodiversity which is linked which is also a very linked to the livelihood of millions of people especially the indigenous people and these community especially the uh, koren community it is very indigenous community of of myama and uh, with these communities right over the resources they have established it also and again what they have done is also they have done the demarcation of ka k a w ka that is means traditional indigenous lands uh, known as in uh, myama so they have demarcation of the traditional indigenous lands because nobody can enter there that is their right in india we have 50 scheduled of the constitution and 50 scheduled and a scheduled area the the tribals uh, the tribal communities indigenous communities of india has right over the resources of course the state is not uh, uh, taking that uh, uh, <clears throat> commitment that to, to obey it. but in uh, our, our country uh, in 2013 the supreme court of india has uh, <clears throat> already given a judgment historical judgment that the indigenous community that are called as dangurias in niyamgiri in our state odisha they have established that the right to resources the gram sabha the village council is the supreme to take decision and that also judgments came on the basis of the fifth schedule of the indian constitution the pesha act of 1996 and also first right act uh, 2006 so that we have law because of struggle so that we have that law and we are, and that law is also endorsed by the supreme court of india in 2013 by which the vedanta mining of bauxite has been banned we could do it this is a also because successful people's movement in niyamgiri in odisha also it has become also a, a campaign for indigenous community throughout india that fifth schedule of the constitution is a protector of our resources and it establishes also right to the indigenous community similarly mr paul the now this green nobel laureate he could establish with community leadership that this democratization of the traditional indigenous lands and that um, uh, salvin river that is the uh, peace park and that intention also the aim is also to for peace democracy and security so i think this is great achievement and also example before us also before the youth and the future generations that how to fight how to get it also because of this crisis of climate change this is also solution that we can go with people we can struggle it and we can establish as an alternative because this peace park what i have studied also is the alternative to the dams that are coming on salvin um, um, river the dam for hydroelectricity and what we also seeing now in also gangas brahmaputras and many rivers in india also that we are been opposing people have been opposing that these dams are or destructive development and this with this diverses and this also the changes the route of natural flow of water also let's uh, so similarly he could establish this peace park as alternative to dams on the salvin river and the uh, <coughs> and uh, and salvin river basin so i think i will not take the time but uh, i i am proud of it and this is an achievement we should learn it i should listen from him that what his experiences and what his also vision of for future so that we can unitedly work for uh, uh, for the protection of for to the prevent the climate change also the protection of the mother earth again i thank you all of you those people also will take part of this discussion and uh, Uh, again i uh, thank to the organizers of this film again i welcome with hearty greetings and congratulations to our friend uh, paul thank you all thank you prafulda and that was from one goldman environmental prize winner to another and now i invite paul to share his insights on his inspiring struggle 
to preserve both the environment as well as culture of Karen indigenous people in Myanmar. This will be followed by an interaction with a panel of noted development justice leaders from across South Asia who we have here with us. And we are really keen to hear from Paul about his work and movement. What inspired him to become so involved and start a people's movement for conservation in the Salween River uh, Basin, the uphills and downhills he faced in his journey, the challenges he overcame, the support he got from other movements, the role of women in his movement, and his future plans, as Prafulda mentioned just now, and much more. So I'm sure the next 45 minutes would be an inspiring time for all of us to hear from Paul. Paul, welcome once again, and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Shobha. And thank you, Prafu. You did a very good introduction and you, you put it all in a nutshell. So I don't think I need to uh, uh, elaborate more. It's very beautiful. Um, it's, I'm yes. very honored. Yes, Paul. You yes. Yes, sorry, you have to elaborate as much as you can. Sorry for uh, the yes. interruption. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, uh, I would like to also interact and uh, hear also uh, from other great uh, people from uh, this um, uh, discussion. And I also uh, see uh, many of other fellow citizens from Myanmar and also my colleagues, also I think uh, at least one or two. So yeah, so yeah, I, I will try to keep uh, if it brief and then also want to um, also, you know, interact and uh, do also exchange with uh, other great people. So, yeah, so um, um, unexpectedly, uh, I was nominated as uh, the winner of uh, the Goldman Environmental Prize for 2020. And then, uh, of course, um, the, the, the prize recognizes uh, my leadership uh, when I say my leadership means I'm not the one who claimed that I established this uh, peace park. I have uh, so many people at my organization. We have alliance, we have um, uh, supporters. Uh, we have uh, so many people around me that uh, work so hard to get to where we are today. So um, so the prize recognizes the um, creation of this unique park, which we call it uh, the Selling Peace Park. And then the, why, why uh, we you know, created this park? Because in our region, we have rich biodiversity. And uh, based on our survey, we have um, um, both uh, uh, threatened and endangered species. And then we are surprised to find those wild animal species that are still thriving in our territory. And also, we also have uh, our current communities with uh, co rich culture and with um, very close relationship with uh, nature and with our ancestral territories. And uh, like uh, pra Prabhu said, you know, we, we practice our uh, customary um, land governance and uh, nature stewardship, and we consider ourselves as uh, indigenous custodians of of the land of the environment. And then also the approach that we we use as uh, and also being recognized by the the foundation that uh, we, uh, we 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 see this approach as uh, peace building or problem solving. Uh, Kind of offering a win-win solution for all people involved, or, or like a stakeholders to the uh, conflict. So th this is the approach that we also use and, and also offer the, the solution to peace building, peace building that really address the uh, voices or, or the voices or the concerns of the people who have been uh, affected by conflicts for so many decades. Um, 
so that, that is sort of the background of why uh, this the recognition and award of this prize. And of course, the journey to arrive to here has been quite uh, long and, and rough. Um, many challenges, of course, uh, as, as I said earlier, that we, the, the region has been affected by uh, armed conflict or civil war for so, let, let's say, more than uh, six decades, seven decades. So uh, it is quite challenging to uh, uh, kind of organize ourselves, organize our communities who have been displaced by armed conflict. And many of them also are in the refugees camp. And uh, some are still in hiding in the uh, jungle because of the, they cannot uh, live in the, 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 the original villages. So those are the kind of uh, challenges that we've been facing, as well as uh, also the area is quite uh, mountainous, as well as uh, difficult to travel. And also the remoteness also add to the challenges in doing consultations. But uh, we have many strengths because of we have, as I said earlier, we have rich culture, we have um, and uh, the, our traditional knowledge, we have our traditional practices that are the, the, the foundation to kind of really create the, this park. Um, it's only a matter of we are bringing together people and uh, trying to uh, organize consultations and brainstorming what should we do uh, in, in this ch ch changing and as well as challenging environment that we are facing today. Because um, especially after uh, 2012, when the Korean National Union uh, had, had signed the um, ceasefire uh, between the government and the, the, and the KNU, um, the, the political environment uh, has been uh, significantly changed. And then it's also opened up the territory for uh, other uh, opportunities for investment in uh, development projects and other natural resource extractions, and as well as the uh, push for building mega dams on the San Luis River. So the, the question for all of us is that, okay, how can we uh, really um, overcome the, these challenges? Uh, we cannot uh, stay, we cannot uh, be the same and do the same thing like we, we do in the past because of the, the threats, the, the, the huge challenges, challenges that are coming uh, to our, into our territory. So we, we, we kind of, yeah, through consultations and at the end we say that we have to initiate this uh, protected area or our conserved areas. In other words, we also call it the ICCA, uh, the Indigenous Community Conserved Areas, uh, Territories of Life. So we need to create this one that can cover uh, all the things that we, we kind of uh, um, uh, think that are most important to us. One is uh, the environment, and the second in our culture, and the third is the peace and the self-determination. Because we, the Indigenous people, we always demand for our rights to self-determination over our ancestral territories, as well as uh, the governance of our natural resources, our natural uh, heritage. Yeah. So, so, so then uh, we, 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 yeah, through you know many years of consultation, then we uh, come to uh, uh, the 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 kind of um, establishment of this park. But before we did that, of course, we developed our charter. We, we uh, uh, kind of uh, do research, get inputs from the communities and design the governance. And the governance that we design is also, uh, is more like a collaborative and co-governance system. It's have representative from the communities, the representative from the civil society organization, as well as uh, uh, representative from the uh, de facto government, the Korean National Union. So we, we have three, three uh, sectors of, of our society and then the plus the, the, the de facto government KNU. So we formed the, 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 the governance of this peace pact. 
And then the, the question about women participation is that we, in the designing of this charter, we, we have, we, we, I look, kind of, we have put that into our charter that we have to have women, you know, like in the, the governance. So we, 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 we design is like uh, in, from each village track, we need to have two representatives. One is woman and one is man. So it has to be that way because uh, we, 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 we really see the uh, power of women in the natural resource governance as well as in the uh, uh, environment and uh, protections and cultural preservation. So we, we kind of really design it that way. And we have seen uh, many encouraging stories uh, from, from our experiences so far. So th this is how we, we, we design it and we uh, created this peace park. And, and, uh, and yeah, so um, yeah, only two years um, since we declare and we, we kind of announced this peace park by ourselves, by our indigenous people. And then we also seen a lot of support from our uh, partners, our uh, indigenous uh, alliances from all over the world. And then, uh, yes, and then we've seen the, this year, we also received the Equator uh, Prize uh, from the UNDP. And then this is uh, also another uh, prize from Bowman Environmental Foundation. Yeah, so, so this is a blessing for us. And especially when we, uh, I mean, the whole world is facing the global pandemic. So this, this is uh, a blessing for us to, to receive this and also been very encouraging to our words to uh, continue to uh, first to, to defend our uh, territories, our rich territories, as well as sustaining our territories in just not just for our generation, but also our future generations. So the, the, in brief, the peace park for us from, from us mean the indigenous people, the indigenous current people. This is uh, 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 kind of a repackage of what we have been doing in the past into a more of a, a, a kind of an agreement that we make with nature, we make with uh, uh, our uh, territories that we're going to maintain our healthy relationship. And then we're going to uh, continue to take care of of this, uh, uh, what do you call it, natural heritage. Because as I said, we, we, we are the guardians of our territory, the guardian of the environment. So we can be able to continue to do that. Of course, we're going to also need to take from nature, but in a more like, a, uh, what do you call it, um, in a more sustainable way. So, um, uh, sorry, what is uh, Shoba? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so, so I, I will probably uh, stop here and, and then probably you, you help me remind me what are those questions and I will uh, continue. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, definitely. Uh, one thing is how do you think this prize will help advance your work? Uh, and yes, uh, on to that, yes. So uh, the, the, the ultimate goal, of course, we, we are trying to say, what do we want to achieve uh, in the long run? Right. So actually, we need to uh, uh, gain uh, uh, recognition, legal recognition uh, of our indigenous right to land and to our resources. Because this is, this is important, because without that, it's, we always um, have to kind of what call it, fight against the injustices that are coming to us. Right? And then we are the, what we call is the last frontier to defend these territories, which are full of life, we love, full of uh, biodiversity. And we all know the whole world, the indigenous people possess the key to you know, the life of our planet. So, but what, what I'm lacking is that we don't have official recognition all over our territory. So this is what we are, we are trying to do at the end. We need to have that, that recognition. So what we are doing now, we have to show what we said. We, the indigenous people, can do conservation. 
based on our practice, based on our knowledge, right? And then we need to show evidence, right? We need to work with uh, people who support us and work together with us, do research and find out, okay, what are the biodiversity in our territory, you know? So how well we can do it. So we need to also combine and work with the scientific uh, knowledge, combine with our indigenous knowledge. Then the visibility will be there and the international recognition coming in. And then one day we hope the government will also started to recognize that and change uh, the law. Right, right, very well said. Uh, Paul, uh, during your struggle and the struggle of course continues, uh, currently what is, uh, what according to you is the top challenge you are facing uh, in your movement in current times? Uh, yeah. Any one, one, the top, the topmost challenge or obstacle you are facing in current times to advance such people's movements. Yes, as I said earlier, it is the insecurity. And then the, the insecurity is a, as a result of the, uh, the militarization in our indigenous territory. Yes. So that's why in this uh, peace building uh, time, we the indigenous people and local communities, we are demanding the uh, governments, the government's troops to withdraw from our territories, to open up space for us to return back to our original uh, villages and our ancestral uh, domain, to be able to farm our uh, rich land. Like, like in, in behind me, there is a farmland. So we, we have, uh, uh, rich fatals group for growing rice. So, so th th this is the, the main uh, challenges that we've been facing. And then uh, although there are uh, ceasefire agreements, but still uh, it is very far from really uh, uh, what you call like uh, working, really that uh, kind of benefiting the local community. So we, we are, that's why part of the initiative of the Sami Peace is to, to cause mobilize people to, to join together to really also voice their concern so that the policy maker, the decision makers also will uh, hear and uh, listen. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, now, uh, the somehow no talks are complete without referring to the pandemic which we are facing. So how has the COVID pandemic, has it affected your movement with, uh, in some way or any adverse impact of it uh, on... Uh, on the work you have been doing because of the pandemic? Um, fortunately, uh, so far we, we haven't seen any big problems or big issues uh, as a result of this pandemic because of, as I said, uh, if most uh, communities really depend on agriculture because of course uh, we indigenous people, uh, main source of uh, um, livelihoods from uh, farming, agricultural activities, and then, and also uh, gathering uh, uh, non-timber forest products from the forest. And then, the, but the only, uh, but some, some uh, communities, especially uh, along the border, uh, people who depend on the local trades, of course, they suffer because of the lockdown, because of the uh, lockdowns, uh, and then the, the kind of closing of the borders. So those communities are affected and then we're also trying to uh, look for ways to also support them. Yes. Okay, uh, I've just turned off my video because my internet connection is weak. So please uh, uh, pardon me for that. Uh, Paul, I'm very curious to know what really inspired you to do such great work? What was your initial inspiration? From where did the inspiration come and when to, to start such a, such a such good work? What was your inspiration? It's a very good question. Uh, I, I think perhaps I, I could say that I have no choice because as I said, uh, conserving uh, nature or protecting the environment is our duty and it's been passing down to us, you know, from our ancestors. Um, and then the, it's part of our way of life, as, as I said earlier, because we, we uh, need to have a, a healthy relationship with 
the guardians of the forest, the guardians of the rivers uh, and wildlife, right? That, that is uh, the, 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 the things that we have to do every day. But as I said, uh, because of the um, threats that are coming into our territory, like from you know, logging, mining, uh, hydropower dams, and, and other uh, infrastructure developments, right? So those, those are the things that, uh, you know, like are really threatening our well-being. So without uh, kind of uh, doing something together with our communities, we will, nev we will never uh, defend our territory. So we, we have to find ways to uh, defend these, you know, these threats. So then, the, yeah, that, that's where I'm trying to uh, also um, uh, mobilize our youth group and then as well as our supporters and establish my organization and then uh, yeah, started the, 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 the activity and initiatives. Um, uh, yeah, I, th I think in brief, I will say that. And then, yeah, of course, uh, if I uh, yeah, have other questions, I may also yeah, elaborate more on that. Yeah. Yes, yes. A and thank you for uh, uh, your inclusion of the women uh, in your movement to that extent, because uh, I personally believe, strongly believe in what we call a feminist fossil fuel free future. A feminist means of solidarity. Solidarity. And solidarity. Feminist for me stands for solidarity. And that is what is against patriarchy uh, in my understanding. Because patriarchy is an assertion of power and feminism is an assertion of solidarity. And uh, that is what your movement and other movements are also aiming for. Can you mention some other social movements which helped you and inspired you or supported uh, your movement? Could you just uh, mention some of yeah, Yes, um, of course, the indigenous people's uh, movement around the world. And then the, especially when I also joined the ICCA consortium, uh, Territory of Life, um, is, is, uh, probably we have some uh, Friends here joining. Uh, Prafu, are you a, a member or honorary member of the ICC consortium? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I'm not. not familiar, maybe, yeah. So, yeah, they, yes. yeah we have many hundreds of uh, members, and then we kind of come um, together you know, from all over uh, you know, the world's regions. So, yeah, we bring in so many experiences and many stories, many. Uh, success stories and then as well as uh, knowledge. So that is also, yeah, been very inspiring for me to learn from from them. And also, we also have learned a lot from the the, the, the experiences in the Philippines um, because they also been working very hard to really uh, um, kind of get the recognition of the indigenous people's right to their lands and natural resources. And then uh, we also learn from them how to do mapping, how to do uh, uh, participatory mapping using a GIS and, and, uh, and, and also other technologies. So it's been very useful for us. And then uh, we, we apply uh, those uh, uh, skills in our work. Uh, that's, that's why we, we, we've been able to uh, demarcate uh, a lot of uh, the goals in our territory. So far, we have finished about 237 calls in our territory. So in the Peace Park, we can say that 70 to 80 percent of the territories is consists of our calls for uh, territory. So imagine uh, those the importance of, of those calls and contributing to the conservation of, of nature and the culture in, in the Peace Park. Uh, what is your message uh, for other social movements, uh, particularly in the current times? Uh, we would like your message, and of course, we'll be coming back to you again. There will be a lot many questions and discussions later on. But what is your message for the other movements? Uh, the question for the other movement. Um, yes, yes. yes. It, I think, yeah, for, for me, I think uh, the most important things uh, we, with the indigenous people, uh, we have to 
uh, we have to be proud of what we have been contributing to the global, uh, uh, what do you call it, the global movement, uh, contributing to safeguard the life of our planet. Because the, the remaining biodiversity of the world are found in our territory. So we have the, a very big role to play to, to make sure that the future of our planet is still uh, a living place. So that, that, is, the, that is our, our uh, big responsibility. So wherever we are, we, 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 whether the government recognize our right or not, we have to do it ourselves. We should not wait for someone to come and give us our right. We have to fight for it. We have to defend it. We have to keep doing uh, the things that uh, our ancestors have been doing in the past. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the time being Paul and we'll be coming back to you. And thank you for such an energizing and inspiring sharing uh, of your experience and of your movement. Uh, we now have a galaxy of human rights defenders here with us. And we would like to hear from each of them on what is the one top challenge or obstacle they are currently facing in their work and how they are trying to overcome it. And let us begin with Harman Kumara from the National Fisheries Solidarity Organization of Sri Lanka. Uh, over to you, Harman. Okay. Uh, first of all, I congratulate to uh, Paul for his uh, very outstanding uh, winning of this uh, uh, Goldman uh, Environmental Prize. So I accept my uh, congratulations to Paul. Uh, we are proud of you. Uh, the second thing, as you asked, Shoba, uh, you know, we are working in, a, in, in an environment where uh, most of our uh, governments are not really listening to us, the people's voice. I think uh, what uh, Paul also said that he had very hard time uh, to uh, work with military and also the authoritative regime in, in, in his country. So uh, if we have a democratic space to articulate our voice, articulate our concerns, our demands, and uh, very rightly Paul said about the, the culture, the environment, and also uh, about our uh, determination of our own resources, how we utilize them. So it is not here. So our main challenge is that our people, uh, mainly the people who are working on the land, water, forest, and all these natural resources, they are really marginalized. So our main challenge is how to make sure these people are really sustain their life because uh, life is very important and we all are working to uh, live peacefully. So uh, when we are fighting or when we are uh, attempting to uh, sustain our life or maybe at least to uh, uh, trying to live, so uh, we are totally uh, neglected. We are totally rejected and never heard about it. So in that context, the most challenging uh, situation is that our own uh, rulers, our own government, they are not really respect the rights of the people. They are really in line with the corporates. They just want to hand in hand, work with the corporates and uh, gain certain benefits, not to the country, but for their own benefit. So then they don't, uh, uh, they don't uh, listen the requirements or the rights of the people. So that's the main challenge that we are facing in my country and what we are experiencing for maybe more than decades. Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, we also have with us today, a Barrister Shamim Heather Patwari, who is a member of parliament from Bangladesh. So over to you, Patwari Saab. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Shobaji. Uh, it's wonderful to hear from Paul Sinta, who has really made a landmark uh, achievement in establishing peace, forest right, and indigenous right. Um, uh, to the extent I know, um, there is no forest right act in Myanmar, as same in Bangladesh, maybe. 
but, but despite that, during the hostility, during the ceasefire, she, he has created a wonderful peace park of 135 million acres in the Salween River Basin. It's, a, it's something unprecedented, unparalleled in the whole world, so far I know. And that is individual initiative, of course, um, in a very critical condition. And, and I know he's going through the same critical condition, but he will achieve more. And uh, I'd like to congratulate Paul Sien, of course, for, for the award. And of course, for his wonderful peace park. park it's a wonderful idea. Uh, we also have hill tracks. We faced hill tracks problem earlier. In 1998, we had an extremely good peace treaty. And there is a resentment on both sides. But yes, but this model is really useful. We still don't call them indigenous for the obvious reason. Uh, there is a mixed up issue. Lots of uh, mainland people is residing there. Uh, there's a movement. Uh, we also really thinking a real good model, um, how to make the economic process inclusive and also how to protect the right to forest and uh, right to land and other things. These are really important. We, we understand the international commitment, of course, and also because Bangladesh is a heavily dense country, it's sometimes uh, on policy issues, it's very difficult to follow those international standards. But of course, we have to protect their rights. My one approach was, uh, to start homestead tourism there in our hill tracks. My one approach is to make sure all investment. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So, so my another approach would be uh, to include them in all future investment, government and non-government as silent partner or uh, sleeping partner. So there will be a statutory requirement. Whoever do any business in hill tracks, the local tribal people must be partner of it. And at 40% to 60% of employees will be from the local tribal. This is really, uh, I think, important. Also, I am advocating personally that in our parliament, it should be reflective parliament. So there must be some reserved seat for the tribal peoples, for the indigenous peoples. Some suggest we should include one from each tribe. In China, they have like this, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that worked for Bangladesh or not because we have hundreds of tribes. There are some tribes who are only 300 members. Still, they need some sorts of representation in parliament. That's, that's the way I think it. We must do it. We also have to do a commission for protecting their rights. And someone from the tribal communities should be headed by, by, by the, headed the commission and look after the issues. So we also have another problem, a serious environmental problem in our hill tracks. And that is also connected with our another advocacy campaign for anti-tobacco movement within the hill tracks. Now the tobacco companies, they are giving advance money to the tribal peoples, uh, to the indigenous peoples. And because they're very poor, they don't have another source, they're taking this advance money and they're cultivating tobaccos. So all the beautiful hill tracks of Bangladesh, which is known as beauty queen of Bangladesh, and they are now covered by, by tobacco cultivation. And one of the most beautiful river, one of the most tourist attraction is our Shangu River. Shangu, it's the river started in a, in a hill called Modok. And this Modok is very close to Myanmar border. And from this Modok hill, this river is almost 294 kilometer length. And it's widened more or less 119 meter. And the both side of the river, you'll see uh, millions of acres land as are now captured by lease or otherwise by the tobacco companies, the influencing the local tribunal uh, tribes and local indigenous people, giving them advance money and in other way, they are uh, advocating the tobacco cultivation. Cultivation. So this is a big challenge in Bangladesh, and also it's affecting climate. It's affecting indigenous people right to land. It's affecting indigenous people's right to development, their future, their children, everything. And and tobacco. There is a disease called tobacco syndrome. The kids are suffering from it, and it's also uh, challenging the biodiversity of the hill crest, Of course. We used to have lots of deers, lots of birds, lots of um, rarest species. Now they're disappearing from hill tracks. One reason is, is because of the tobacco cultivation and, and, and then also drying up the tobacco leaves. You know, that, that also need lots of um, uh, trees they're cutting to dry, dry up the tobacco leaves and the smell. So it's affecting tourism. It's affecting indigenous communities life cycle. It's affecting biodiversity affecting river and everything. So this is one of the things we need to worry about in future. 
And I like to finish um, now because I have to congratulate uh, Paul C. and Ta again. I know uh, you face lots of odds in achieving uh, your Peace Park and the award. I'm sure the award will encourage you and hundreds of the people who is working all over the world to protect their people from uh, from, in, from intervention, from um, from, minor, from majority intervention, uh, and from autocracy or other things, whatever, all over the world. I think we all human rights activists, we form a global community. And of course, Shobaji is one of the pioneering in, pioneering in formulating this community, this platform. And we, we should work together for the global harmony and global human rights. Uh, we have some tribes who have only 100 people. And we have to look at them as well. We have some tribes who have 3 million people. We have tribes who are really rich uh, than the mainstream Bangladeshi peoples. We have tribes who are really poor than ever is Bangladeshi people. So we, we really have to look after all of them. We have to make inclusive human rights and right-based approach to protect them. And of course, protect their environment. That's also necessary for the nation. And your model, your success will really inspire us. And I'd like to share that in the upcoming days in parliament, your success story in a, of course, diplomatic way. Um, so, uh, so I like to oh, I like to share your stories in, in, in the parliament or committee. Uh, and we want to develop a similar model in our hill tracks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patwari ji. And thank you for really pointing out that our current development model is actually killing biodiversity and it mm. is also killing the environment. And, being, and uh, it will be great if such questions are raised in parliaments because uh, they need to be part of the movement also, uh, our leaders and uh, politicians. Uh, thank you very much. And we now move to Pakistan. And uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Abdul Hamid Nayar. Uh, he's a noted physicist and researcher and peace activist who wants a borderless, visa-free and nuclear-free South Asia. So over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me to this uh, very important and uh, uh, inspiring session. And uh, congratulations to Paul and to our I'm meeting you for the first time, and I'm very much inspired by your work. I think I think uh, <clears throat> uh, your uh, honor that has been given to you is actually to all the pe all the people's movements that are struggling to survive in these times where everybody is looking for for rapid development and mega development and all of that. You know, um, in fact, um, yeah, I'm, I'm personally not. Uh, very much involved in environmental work, uh, just peripherally, uh, and therefore my uh, my my uh, uh, submission about Pakistan would be uh, only about a few uh, major issues. Uh, not about not not I won't be able to represent uh, the, all the kinds of work that are that are taking place over here. Uh, the essential thing is that uh, Pakistan uh, is, uh, Pakistani state is going after mega projects. This is the, this is what all the countries are doing. And uh, we happen to have a big support from China for mega projects. And China happens to be a, uh, uh, you know, a neighbor of nearly all of, our, uh, all of us over here. Um, uh, even with, uh, I think Myanmar, it wants to also have project, uh, run projects in Myanmar, and it is, uh, it likes to have to run projects. It is doing that in Nepal, and uh, uh, it would like to perhaps do that in India also. But Pakistan has <clears throat> uh, fallen for uh, the uh, development project assistance from China in a big way. Now uh, that is uh, leading to a large number of big, big projects. So uh, many of the projects that I will talk about today would be a part of that. Now, whenever there are big mega projects inside, uh, our rulers uh, happen start to uh, dream of big. 
and then they become very impatient with those people who, whose rights are uh, trampled upon and who would like to whose rights who would like their rights to be protected uh, and they become very impatient and they brand them as uh, uh, you know anti national uh, not patriotic and therefore, they, 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 they actually don't listen, not only really that they don't listen to them, they um, deprive them of their basic uh, uh, rights and, uh, and uh, in the name of uh, these big projects. Uh, one, there are, there are, uh, perhaps you know that Pakistan uh, is Indus Valley. Indus Valley in the sense that it is, it is the valley through which in the river Indus passes. And, and Pakistan's agriculture depends a great deal on uh, this river. And uh, this river is therefore, is being, Pakistan finds it necessary to harness the water flowing through this river uh, again and again so that it can cultivate its land. But that has created a lot of uh, problem in Pakistan. Um, the lower riparians have started to receive less water. The rivers have the river downstream has started dry up in uh, for much of uh, the year, and then uh, at the end, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, you know many of the fisher folk people who used to live on river and do the fishing and cut uh, mangrove trees and sell in the market and so on and so forth, who were actually dwellers on the river, have disappeared. They had to; they just couldn't afford to continue living there. Uh, similarly, uh, the water, shortage of water at the delta amounted to sea water coming up. And because of that, a large amount of land has been destroyed. And mangroves have been destroyed. And because of that, fishes have also uh, migrated to some other places. And hence, uh, uh, the, the fisher folk on the sea, on the shores uh, of the Arabian Sea, have also uh, started to suffer. And uh, to the extent that a large number of them had, had been forced to actually migrate out of that place, migrate to big towns and do any kind of job that comes before them so that they could have uh, two meals a day. So this is, this, is, this is something which is actually, you know, hurting them. There is this development for the sake of um, providing meal to ourselves but that is depriving other people of their means. And this kind of uh, inequity has, uh, is, is, is at the moment being, uh, there are people who are fighting for them. They have, there are organizations, there are these Fisher Folk Forum, and there are uh, uh, organizations of, um, uh, you know, the, the farmers um, who are fighting for their rights in various regions. Um, so, so the dams uh, are the things where you know, you know the, the country would say that you know we need to uh, uh, not let water just pass through and go into the sea without benefiting us, and therefore we need to actually stop it and have this redistribute it so that we have we maximize our agricultural production. And the consequence, I, I just told you what the consequences are. So this is what is happening. And um, there are other uh, things as well. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there are uh, in the, the, the people's movements, although there are many peaceful people's movements like uh, officials and lack of uh, farmers and of uh, uh, people living in the hills and so on. But then uh, the state at the moment, with the, the, the recent history of the state, um, has been uh, a little unique in South Asia. It has been trying to uh, support some kind of insurgencies in the countries, in the, in the neighborhood. And because of those insurgencies, it has created a large amount of strife within the society itself. And uh, the, the, all the strife that, the, uh, that our rulers wanted to export to other countries around have actually uh, fallen back on to ourselves also. So we, have, we are actually at the moment as a society 
which has, which is also suffering from a large amount of internal strifes and internal strifes are uh, of ethnic nature of religious nature sectarian nature um, and, and 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 of uh, other kinds uh, those things are actually hurting people's movements because then people also get divided on those lines i think the biggest problem to people's movement are these divisions that are created by our rulers or you know that has has been created by the um uh, by the by the recent uh, uh, history of ours and uh, people's movements suffer because of that because uh, rather than fight for their rights they fight for their identities and uh, you know uh, such things and they fight among themselves so i hope that is not the case in Myanmar, and I hope that is not the case in any country in this region, because uh, people's solidarity with each other is terribly important. Uh, if we have uh, to, to, to uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, protect our rights through people's movements, uh, then we have to overcome the kind of divisions that come in the society through these strifes. For the moment, the people's movements are finding it very difficult to combat these uh, strifes. Uh, and, 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 and I don't know how the future uh, will take the shape, but uh, uh, I think what movements are doing nowadays are actually trying to uh, minimize the impact of these internal uh, divisions and internal strifes. Uh, that is where I will, I think I, I will just, uh, on this sort of uh, discouraging note, I will stop. But I think uh, our movements, people's movements must struggle, must study the people's movements in the region, particularly uh, and try and seek inspiration from them. Thank you very much for the invitation to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And uh, on your behalf, I take back your statement that you are not uh, a part of uh, any such movement. I think you are part of very much a part of all the movements and from what you have said and from what you have been aspiring to and aspiring to achieve. So um, all force to all your efforts. Uh, and uh, we now come to India. We have with us Dr. Sandeep Pandey, a noted social activist and a Ramon Magsese awardee. And Sandeep Ji is also Vice President of Socialist Party of India. And he also roots for a borderless, visa-free and nuclear-free South Asia. Over to you, Sandeep Ji, to talk about the one great obstacle you are facing in current times to keep your movement alive and, and how are you overcoming that challenge? So um, thank you, uh, Shobha Ji, and uh, congratulations to Paul. Uh, for the immensely important, yeah, Namaskar, uh, immensely important work that uh, you are doing. I think as uh, Harman pointed out and, uh, you know, even other speakers after him, um, the biggest challenge that we face is the attack from the corporate on the natural resources in connivance with the governments. And uh, presently, everybody realizes the, the uh, gravity of the, uh, the danger and uh, all of us in our own ways are fighting against this uh, um, you know, attempt by the corporates to capture the, the natural resources. Uh, I, I personally have been involved in, in struggle against Coca-Cola, uh, at least at two places in India. Um, at one place, we were successful in closing down the plant, but at the other place, we were not in spite of a bigger struggle there. Um, and it has become very difficult to fight these corporates because uh, of their money power. They can easily influence the political parties, the policy makers, and even the media. So much so that the media will not write about uh, them. Uh, you know, in, it is very interesting in our a struggle against Coca-Cola in Varanasi, um, except for the initial period, uh, the corporate would, uh, the, the media would report the struggle as 
you know, um, uh, struggle against uh, uh, a soft drink manufacturer without naming Coca-Cola and would point out the, the small incidents like, uh, you know, the, the bait and charge by the police, the arrest of activists, but would not highlight the main issues, which were the depletion of water table, the contamination of water and soil because of uh, dangerous pollutants coming out with the sludge. So this is, this is a big challenge. And, and uh, India is presently going through a, a very important phase where after years of, uh, you know, uh, economic policies of privatization, liberalization and globalization, which essentially mean that, that you are privatizing every sector and you are allowing multinational corporations to enter your markets. Um, the farmers have finally put their foot down and there are three laws uh, which were passed by the parliament this year itself. Uh, and all three of them are in the favor of corporates. One of them allows contract farming directly. So the corporations can, can enter into agreements with farmers. And we have had a history where, where uh, Mahatma Gandhi had to go to a place in Bihar, Champaran, where the British were dictating the farmers to grow indigo and they were, they were setting the price for it. So the farmers were so exploited that uh, uh, the, the Mahatma Gandhi had to carry out a struggle. In fact, his first struggle in India was in Champaran. And it, it reminds us of those days where, you know, corporations would start, um, you know, dictating terms to the farmers. The second law is about uh, abolishing the ceiling over, over um, storage of food grains um, and, and other uh, essential food items. In fact, it is called the, the um, uh, Essential Commodities Act. So there is an amendment in that act. And the amendment is basically to take off the ceiling. Uh, so now there is nothing called holding. Holding has been legalized in India and, and uh, you can very well imagine who will benefit from this. And uh, the third law is uh, doing away with the minimum support price guarantee to the farmers um, uh, for, some, for some agricultural produce, including uh, the, the grains, which, which compose the, the uh, staple diet of, of most of the Indians. Uh, that is the wheat and rice. Um, so uh, taking away the guarantee of minimum support price from farmers on one hand and allowing uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi multinational giants to sell our water, water which they, which they take out from underneath our land to sell it to us at 20 times the profit. Uh, whereas the farmers in, in this country have been fighting for uh, a respectable price of one and a half times, merely one and a half times of their investment and the government is not willing to give it to them. So um, I think all our societies are passing through this phase as I hear stories from different countries where, uh, where we are trying to uh, preserve, preserve our natural resources from being taken away by corporations for for um, uh, you know, um, unlimited profit in connivance with the governments, and it is the same pattern all over the world. Uh, so, from that point of view, uh, what Paul has done is very important because, uh, in spite of people struggling everywhere, there are very few success stories. There are very few, you know, uh, Supreme Court judgments like in the case of Niyamgiri, which uh, Praful. Uh, Samantha uh, uh, described earlier where the tribals uh, right over the Niyamgiri hills where a multinational corporation Vedanta wanted to mine bauxite uh, so the rights of tribal were recognized and the company was not allowed to, to mine bauxite from that, that place even though it had, it had already built up a processing plant. Now this is an arrogance these companies know that they can have their way you know, by hook or crook. So the company, even before starting the mining, had already set up a processing plant uh, to make uh, aluminium. And uh, uh, finally, you know, it was not allowed by the Supreme Court to do this mining. 
so uh, but these kind of uh, stories are are few and far between uh, most of the struggles actually um, do not succeed and ultimately the corporations are successful in taking over uh, the natural resources um, by one way or the other so from that point of view the large area uh, which paul has been able to declare as peace park is is very important and and uh, i am i must congratulate him uh, doubly because he is working in in a country uh, which which uh, doesn't have i mean it in the name it has a democracy but everybody knows that the military has an upper hand in 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 myanmar um, but the situation is now same in other countries india has democracy but uh, you know it is not really a democracy because people's rights are not being recognized um, so uh, from that point of view uh, the work that you have done paul in myanmar is very important and it is very inspiring to all of us it 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 uh, tells us that we should we should carry on with our struggles and not give up and ultimately the people's power will win in in uh, in democracy or or otherwise uh, because uh, you know um, it is uh, natural that that uh, whatever the majority people think that should be the the system and uh, and we hope that you know the governments and the corporations and the international financial institutions will recognize the rights of the of the local indigenous people to have uh, a say over how their resources will be ultimately used um as as uh, was pointed out by one of the speakers if if uh, any corporation wants to use the resources um they have to make the local people partner but if the local uh, people especially the indigenous people uh, do not want this activity um at any cost then that right has to be recognized like our supreme court said that uh, the right of the of the niamgiri tribals uh, was recognized not because their their life and livelihood was under threat but because their cultural rights were under threat because their their niam god the the tribals believed that their niam god lived in those hills and any mining would disturb the abode of that god so ultimately it was the recognition of cultural rights of those tribes so so that is very important it is not just a question of of uh, you know development and growth in material terms um after all the the human happiness is the ultimate thing and uh, any policies or or any decisions uh, should be taken uh, uh, keeping in mind the happiness of the local people so i am very happy for you paul that you have won this award and and i hope you carry on with your wonderful work of of the empowerment of indigenous people in myanmar and uh, we will be we will continue to be inspired by your work and will try to expand the kind of work that you have done in myanmar in other areas of uh, south asia as well thank you so much thank you very much uh... Uh, sandeep bhai uh, i can see uh, krishna gautam from nepal is here with us and he is founder of uh, aging nepal uh, so krishna ji would you like to please say something thank you shivaji for this time and i feel very lucky uh, to join this group uh, this meeting today because i got chance to hear laureate paul samin patwari sahab Abdul Nayar Saab and Pandey Sir, they are all so wonderfully experienced teachers of our society. Uh, uh, I'm I'm working in Nepal. Uh, my focus is aging population. Generally, we our country uh, government decides older people as 60 plus age, and we also did uh, you know many we try to involve them in social development activities. the including conservation uh, but the formal uh, structure that government follows in conservation things these older people aged people uh, are excluded or they don't get window to contribute in such activities mm, for example uh, most of the particularly older women uh, are more than 95% are illiterate so 
and all this formal structure and signing and meeting and all that, it simply does, doesn't fit them. Uh, but what I have uh, experienced is when it comes to conservation and local environment, uh, about the community, the lower you go at the real field level, they are, they are the most knowledgeable people. They, are, they work so diligently, so passionately, they put heart into it. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, but somehow that group uh, has very little window uh, to participate in the, in the, let's say, the sustainable development goal. Uh, if you see all the 17 goals, there are very limited windows left for the old aging population, uh, older people to participate and contribute uh, for the achievement of uh, this, uh, our sustainable goal, including the sustainability of the environment, of our local climate, and whatever Laurent Powell has done. And it was so exciting to hear the model you have done for your community. Uh, I think that model is, uh, it's not only suitable for your community. I think that is equally very good uh, thing for for country like Nepal and maybe other country. But so for sure, uh, it is a very. Uh, I'm fortunate to hear from uh, Paul today that your model is so useful for us to follow. So I want to hear from uh, Laurent Paul about: uh, uh, Are you taking any special attention uh, to involvement of older people, uh, particularly older women and 60 plus age people in your conservation work. Uh, because, uh, you know, all this formal development sector like uh, agriculture and all other things that the government do, uh, they are simply, older people are simply not included the, in that part. Neither, neither is a participant nor as a beneficiary. So how, how, how are you doing in your community so that we can learn from you and we can, you can, we can pressure in our Nepal uh, to involve, uh, learn from uh, the work of Lord Paul has done. Uh, because uh, uh, older people are passionate about uh, conservation and they are left out from other mainstream social development because of all this uh, uh, digital and uh, illiteracy thing. So how you are doing it uh, how, uh, about the particularly focus with older women, uh, women of uh, 60 plus age and men of 60 plus age. And I see that uh, uh, in last 70 years, our countries have added at least 30 to 40 years of our life expectancy. But how to use that 30 to 40 years of added life in our society and societal development and uh, conservation? It's not conservation of river and what uh, Lord Paul is doing, not conservation of fishery and water and forest. He's, he's, he's conserving. Your work is conserving a civilization. A, 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 a life style, a livelihood, a, a, a society as, a, as a whole uh, from its all perspective. So uh, could you please, uh, Laurent Paul, uh, focus on his experience with uh, involvement of older persons in your conservation work? Thank you, Pauli. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Krishna Ji. And uh, Paul, would you like to respond to uh, what uh, Krishna Ji has requested for. Thanks, Krishna. Yes, yeah. I think I'm very passionate about uh, what you said, and I totally agree with you. Very, very important to uh, involve elder people, um, and definitely in in our in the Peace Park, uh, we involve our elders people because they are the uh, knowledge holders of our society. And and we 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 call it in Korean me me means those who have the expertise about nature about our relationship with uh, um, nature. Um, so in the in in the, when when we trying to started to learn about uh, how you know like our ancestor in the past had 
you know, done such kind of uh, conservation activities. You know, okay, we have to learn, okay, how do, uh, why, why the, uh, our traditions prohibits us to hunt uh, uh, great hornbill or uh, hula gibbon or uh, tigers. So th these are in our taboos, you know, th these are our taboos and we have to uh, learn why, why such taboos exist. So we have to learn from our elders. Yeah? And then the elders, you know, like uh, are the one who, who kind of knows the history of our people. So, so th this is in, in, in a governance, we also form a, a kind of a advisory board that we also uh, invite the elders to also join that in order to kind of uh, give us the uh, guidance in our uh, work. And, and then the, the woman, elder woman, they also possess a deep knowledge about the herbal medicine. Uh, because, you know, like when, when uh, the daughters have baby or something like that. The old mother will always say, okay, when, when the children are sick, so you go and get this kind of plant and you do like this and, you know, like, and then uh, kind of treat the, 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 the children. So we, we kind of very much, I'm being very much encouraged by working with the elder people. And then whenever we have activities, we invite them and then we also ask them to share, to share their, their story. Like, how do you conserve the forest? uh how how do you uh like uh, do fishery you know fishing hunting so those kind of things definitely is important uh, for for our work and also another one is we also um are doing research about uh, our traditions our practices to document it to, to document it and then we also wanted to uh propose that into our education system our, in our uh, uh, curriculum so because without uh, really knowing our culture for the long run, we will disappear as, as a nation, as, as, as indigenous people. Right? So we, we have been doing this research and then we're going to develop it into a, a curriculum. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, agree or not, but without women, whether they are old or young, we cannot move forward much. I, I firmly believe in that. So, so women have to be at the mainstay and the forefront. Uh, we have with us Pushpa Achanta, who's a gender justice activist from India. And uh, Pushpa Ji, would you like to add on something and have your say, please? Um, yeah, actually, see, I work also sometimes makes me upside down. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, uh, thanks. And I'm in a very August gathering. I'm a very whatever small or a junior person here, because, uh, you know, Shobha and Sandeep and all, we've all been friends and uh, co-travelers for a long time, learned a lot from Sandeep Bhaya. Uh, and uh, thanks for, uh, you know, inviting me. Uh, actually, um, yeah, I, I, as a writer and uh, journalist, I've seen, I see gender, uh, imbalance or uh, gender-based issues everywhere uh, and we know that uh, often the outspoken bravery uh, and uh, pragmatism with which uh, women and uh, gender sexual minorities, I work a lot with gender sexual minorities, I myself identify as gender fluid and asexual. So uh, actually I think we should stop calling ourselves and considering ourselves minorities, you know, because uh, many times our voices we ensure that are amplified and uh, the truth, which actually is very hard and like Sandeep was saying, which is often suppressed, comes only from us or from the bare women, the brave women of Niamgiri and so many other places, the whole, uh, you know, what uh, Paul was talking about first, congrats and salutes to you, Paul and your movement. Again, okay, that uh, the, you know, that's why we refer to it as Mother Earth, right? Uh, the Earth has uh, every for everyone's need, but perhaps not for everyone's greed, as they say. So I, I think we have a lot to learn, lot to uh, do together from uh, the, you know, the often silenced, invisibilized uh, uh, genders, the people 
actually um, and in many cultures uh, you know we are we are of there often this concept of two three four spirit people so this whole thing of you know i i have stopped seeing the world as a binary of man and woman male and female or you know just black and white many of us definitely know there's so much of uh, fluidity there's so much of um, what do you say uh, you know things in between and people in between so i think uh, unless we pay attention uh, to us because uh, we can't just anymore talk about diversity and inclusion we have to not just walk the talk we have to just run the talk that uh, if if we want to ignore what unfortunately the supreme court of india once called as a minuscule minority it is i think at a great risk to ourselves and you know it 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 will be a great shame if you uh, uh, ignore just like we should not ignore the indigenous groups i mean who is indigenous who is not indigenous i think many of us came from such background uh, and then we have arrogated ourselves into thinking we are more educated and technology has helped us but we also have to see that many things are where they started or perhaps even worse and as we say you know in the gender justice movement that gender violence has often uh, new forms but the old forms have not gone so sim i think it's a similar thing everywhere uh, you know uh, that un unless uh, we uh, i i know it is tough uh, like uh, sandeep said about whether we are talking about you know corporate takeover of everything of or everyone or about like nayar saab said about you know the whole thing about you know the 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 cruel justification of uh, the need for nuclear energy um i i've heard nayar ji even earlier many times and even met him i don't know if he remembers me but in princeton uh, so uh, unless we hear amplify these voices i think we have a lot to lose and uh, we are actually not just ignoring we are going to struggle and suffer more for all the uh, people who are silenced all the movements or all the uh, you know people who are uh, suppressed all not just the people i think the other living beings also because uh, you know the earth or or life itself has um, been made for us to coexist but we are refusing to coexist so i think uh, these are some of the lessons the that you know we have learned uh, along the way and what especially feminism has taught me that uh, if if we do not uh, if if we just kind of uh, while it's very challenging while it is very tiring if we let uh, you know the majoritarian takeover happen i think it has happened but some way or the other if we do not continue to resist if we do not continue to uh, a fight if we do not continue to voice our opinions our needs our struggles i think uh, it, it would be shameful it would be wrong to blame others uh, for not doing so uh, that's all i want to say thank you so much thank you pushpa thank you for bringing out very important points uh, and uh, i can see mustafa mirani who's vice chairperson pakistan fisher folk forum uh, we have heard harman kumara from sri lanka on uh, for fisher folk so uh, mirani ji would you like to say something mustafa mirani ah uh, yeah ma'am uh, thank you for inviting me uh, yes. i'm very happy to see in the this meeting but i think harman kumara will speak and will tell all about the pakistan not only the pakistan fisher folk forum but all the world fisher folk uh, problems and issues uh, and connecting with the sdg goals so i think harman kumara can uh, express the views uh, uh, in a good uh, way you know sorry uh, mirani ji harman has spoken already we would like to hear your views uh, from across pakistan okay thank you yes, yes. Uh, so uh, in pakistan here is the worst condition of the uh, fisher folk communities uh, because uh, there, there are many problems like uh, in the inland fisheries there is the uh, shortage of the fresh water because of the climate change and uh, on other side when we see the marine fisheries 
so there is the also problems because the uh, government of pakistan wants to uh, to, uh, to establish the new cities on the islands yes uh, so there are so many problems and uh, there is a lack of the uh, sustainable fisheries policy in federal government uh, even in provincial government also because uh, uh, with the amendment of the 18 amendment the fisheries is the provincial uh, matter so uh, now we are trying on our uh, basis that we can make the uh, the policies regarding the fisher people so uh, but the due to the covid 19 Uh, uh the progress is very slow uh, but we are hopeful that the government of the uh, of the pakistan and the government of the sindh province uh, yeah. because we have only the uh, 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 sea in the two provinces sindh and balochistan but either the island uh, inland fisheries are the uh, very rich in our country okay okay Th thank Make you very much Okay. Thank, you, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So we continue with the discussions. And if the panelists have any questions or comments for Paul, uh, you are please free to ask. And likewise, Paul, if you want to ask the panelists anything, you can go ahead. Uh, meanwhile, I also invite the participants for their questions or comments, as we have been requesting them. Uh, we already have a few questions which I will take up uh, after a while. those who are using the zoom platform please use the chat function to type in your question or raise your virtual hand and those watching on facebook can type in their questions in the comment box so uh, any questions or comments from the panelists to each other or to paul and vice versa uh, please continue shobha ji yes yeah i don't have any question or any comment but a request uh, to paul that uh, uh, that a very important struggle of farmers which is going on in india which i just described um, it would be very nice if you could issue a statement in support uh, because you have just won this award so your your voice will be heard and it will be of great help to the indian farmers and similarly i would request uh, other friends you know um, from the other south asian countries to support the farmers struggle in india in in whichever manner they can i mean there are uh, farmers in germany and and uh, other countries Ind indians who have migrated you know they have come out with their tractors on the road you know in support of uh, the indian farmers so uh, th that would be very nice thank you this is the only request i wanted to make yes Yes, Paul. Over to you. Paul, would you like to respond to that? Please. Yes, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Yeah, very much. Uh, yeah, agreed. And then uh, I, I write my email there, Paul. Yeah, uh, please uh, send me. the links or the issues there so that i i can uh, follow up on it yeah All definitely right. we should uh, uh like uh, show our solidarity definitely we are happy to okay. do that yes. i i will do that i will do that yes i <laughs> Yeah, I will just like to say that I, uh, Sandeep Bhaiya, I will send you uh, Paul's email and uh, I will connect you all over email. Thank you. Thanks. Then, uh, yeah. uh any any other uh, if paul wants to ask or any other panelists uh, would like to ask anything um, uh, yes uh, yeah i, I yeah. think that's not the question but a uh, comment that uh, yeah i'm very inspired by all of the panelists uh, sharing of the stories and the uh, kind of movements and i you know listening to all the panelists and we all you know share the same problems issues you know like uh, we are you know facing the you know injustices so um as as uh, yeah many of the panelists say you know like uh, we have to keep fighting and fighting and then uh, most of the times uh, we the uh, people or the indigenous 
communities, uh, we we are losing, you know, at the end, and that those who have the power and the money always win. So that, that's where you know, like that's why we need to um, uh, really um, build our movement, social movement, and then the, not just only maybe uh, in our own country, but as well as you know, like a building the, our regional kind of movement as well as a, our global movement. And uh, as uh, the, probably the first panelist uh, who talk about the, the, the big uh, project is uh, coming up in our region. Um, yeah, I, I mean, should I say this like a, what do you call it? Um, the BRI, right? The, the uh, Belt and Road Initiatives that will also cross, you know, uh, our country, Myanmar, as then cross to <laughs> India, Pakistan. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we know that uh, these are, you know, the, the big threats. And, and then on another hand, we also see the crisis really um, uh, coming to our planet. So unless really the world's leaders uh, realized and they really started to uh, change radically, I, I think uh, the future of our uh, humanity and, and, and it's also planet will, yeah, we end. Uh, so I, I think that the, the indigenous people's movement is so valuable. Uh, so I, I really encourage uh, to all of you to continue to do uh, the movement. And, uh, and also I'm very uh, honored and happy to also join in, in ways that I can. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have a very interesting question uh, from Thailand uh, for Paul to respond and, and for every one of us. Uh, and this is uh, from Na Kia Duryakul. Kia, Kia Duryakul. And uh, Na says that as a Thai citizen, it is interesting to me that Thailand is home to several human rights struggles uh, from LGBTIQ to gender to indigenous, indigenous peoples to Myanmar related and even Burmese publications for human rights operate from Thailand. But Thai citizens themselves are striving for democracy. And the political situation right now there in the country is challenging, although we have relatively better civil liberties in many aspects. So uh, she uh, now wants to know if uh, uh, Thailand helping people's movements in Burma also. And, uh, why this, like, there's so many movements originating from Thailand, but uh, they themselves are struggling for uh, more democracy. Uh, Paul, your comments on that. It's a very good question. Yes, we have been very uh, privileged to uh, receive the support from Thailand. And then also we've uh, been working with the uh, Thai uh, environment NGOs. They are very supportive and they, they have also lots of uh, skills and experiences. So that, that's how it's contributed to the halting or delaying of the uh, mega development dams on the Salami River. Yes. There is does, a question. Does, does this yes. answer the question? Yeah, it, that, yes, perhaps. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, now has to say if it has answered the question or not. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Paul Belisario that across Asia and around the world, repressive governments and military forces are movement, especially in people's asserting their right to land, life, and self-determination. How do you convince and encourage your people to carry on the fight in the face of such brutal and giant enemies. Paul. Uh, as I say, you know, like uh, no matter what uh, the threats are, we, we have to defend our territories uh, for, for ourselves and as well as for, for our children. And then the, that, that, that is uh, because we have no other choice, as, as I said earlier. So uh, let, let me give you an example, a real story that uh, one of my closest uh, uh, colleagues and friends who was killed in early 2018 by the, the, the government's army, 
uh, while he was uh, driving a motorbike in his own territory. So, um, but th that is a, a, a kind of what you call a, a devastating incident for our movement. But what, what I personally gained, uh, 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 what do you call it, gained uh, motivation as well as uh, courage is from his wife. After, after her husband died, he stood up and he continued the work of his husband. And he's one of the most active women in, in our Selling Peace Park activities. So that, that's, that's why, uh, uh, as I say, you know, the participation of women is, is, is the power of our, our uh, Selling Peace Park uh, initiative. Okay, Shobha, yes. you can add yes. something, please? Yes, please, uh, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, actually, this is also something which I heard from a uh, queer friend in Thailand, uh, from Thailand, who was uh, uh, studying in India. So the, this person told me, actually, you know, everybody thinks Thailand, a uh, lot, uh, you know, there's much freedom and all that. And that's the, uh, and this is not just to, it, just, just that it happens to be Thailand, but I think this is true for many South Asian democracies or South, if I might say, Asian democracies. We supposedly, you know, taught the world so much. We, we supposedly, you know, have given the world so much and we continue giving. And, you know, for us also, in a way, nature has been very bountiful. But somewhere, it's almost also like we say, you know, when the oppressed, oppressed becomes the oppressor. So somewhere, I think the, uh, we, we have lost track of uh, I'm not talking so much about, you know, glorifying ancient culture or not. Of course, we should. I think we have lost some touch with grassroots. We have uh, kind of ignoring it uh, 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 to our peril. Okay. And here, of course, there are so many of your leaders who many of us have learned from. And uh, I think this is something which you all have taught us. And I think somewhere we should keep reminding ourselves and the support the generations who are younger than us that don't touch, lose touch with the grassroots with the realities that's why we keep saying no ground realities ground realities okay and other thing is much as you know we don't want to partner with certain forces certain struggles certain uh, ideals but I think a multi-pronged strategy is the only thing that we will work. Whether you want to do it through online campaigns, whether you want to take to the streets, whether you want to connect with people, whatever. I think that the, you know we, we cannot uh, ignore what older people, what current generation people, what younger people say. So uh, if this, uh, you know, it is so much easier that said than done say that all minorities should unite and then we'll become the majority. But I think there is no other way that while keeping in touch with the grassroots realities or the grassroots workers or the grassroots people, we must also look at, you know, strategies to kind of uh, bond across. That is why, you know, it, it, I've actually written a poem about being a borderless, um, that we need to break borders and boundaries. And I think somewhere, and then such uh, gatherings like today are so important. And uh, so this is perhaps one more uh, strategy, you know, have online learnings, not just online learnings, online collaborations, whatever, and uh, exchange people to people contact. Because we know that the politicians, uh, we have, you know, do are, are very united <laughs> behind uh, the, the closed doors. So, and I think uh, while each of us need to respect our individual identities and the struggles, that uh, uniting, collaborating with mutual respect uh, is perhaps the only, one of the main ways. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pushpa. And as now from Thailand says that let us dream of one world and one humanity. Uh, uh, Paul, any, uh, any remarks from you on that? Yes, I, I, think, I think that's correct. If, if we uh, take a, a, the, the dimension from the environmental uh, perspective, because uh, we don't have borders, we animals can cross the countries, uh, political boundaries, 
the air, you know, uh, the river, like, like the Selmini River is a transboundary, international transboundary rivers. So our, our campaign is to also maintain this uh, river as a free flowing river. So that's why we need collaboration from the, uh, uh, from all, you know, the country that share this river. And I think so many other rivers in India also uh, have this kind of river. So uh, definitely when, when we uh, run our campaign, we need to uh, build up that. And the, the important is that we, we uh, have, need to keep pushing uh, the, the policy makers, the governments and the institutions, the what they call it, development institutes to understand our indigenous people and local communities worldview about the rivers. You know, how we perceive the rivers. Because most of the time, uh, as uh, at the, uh, one of the speakers, earlier speakers said, you know, they only see the, the rivers or water as something that, uh, as commodities, as something that they, they can uh, make profit from, like, like building dams and uh, have, you know, like electricity, as well as other, uh, you know, like uh, irrigation kind of thing. But indigenous people see many other values and, and it's based on our culture. So I think that we need to really uh, uh, kind of, yeah, promote that and make sure that they understand that. And also our people, our community themselves also understand that and they're really, uh, you know, coming together to, to voice this and, and, and also demand an inclusive uh, governance of our resources like rivers, land, forests. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I think also we need to remember that uh, somehow I find it important for myself that my freedom ends where somebody else's begins. So, uh, because very often people understand freedom in very different ways that we are free, but I think we have to, we have to have that sort of a line and border that, uh, of course, borderless states, borderless countries, fine. But we have to keep in mind other people's freedoms also when we are talking of our own freedom. Uh, do you think that is important, Paul? Uh, can, can my, you repeat? Yes, yeah. I, I'm saying that my freedom ends where somebody else's begins. Because sometimes we talk of over that I am free to do this, but that, that is not the freedom for somebody else. Because governments may be saying that they are free to do certain things and it is their freedom, but uh, that is impinging upon the freedom and rights of other peoples. Yes. So, so that is why we talk of rights as well as responsibilities. Yes. When we talk of rights, responsibilities are also there. So, That's a very kind uh, position. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. yes. So uh, I think uh, uh, we are... Uh, running over time also but before we close uh, we know that we have international human rights day on december 10 so can we have a short message from each of our panelists uh, beginning from paul what is your message for uh, international human rights day paul i lost your last okay the international human rights day uh, which we have on 10th of december your message for it Oh, my message. Message. Yes, yes. Okay, can, can you start with other first? Okay, okay, okay. Sa Sa Sandeep, uh, Sandeep Pandey, can you give your message, please? I mean, because it is uh, an interna international uh, human rights day, and um, uh, I have been invited by Punjab Engineering College to speak uh, um, on... Um, the situation in India and I have chosen the topic uh, that some of our best citizens are in jail and this is the situation uh, that uh, in India the intellectuals, lawyers, writers, uh, professors, um, activists, you know, working with, with the marginalized sections of the population are in jail and similarly uh, the people who are doing the most important work in society. As Bobby mentioned uh, yesterday in a mail, which I found uh, very poignant, in the summer, the Indian government harassed the workers, the workers who, who work in, in factories and, and thereby, uh, you know, contribute to the GDP of the country. Uh, they, they, work, they, of course, work in the secondary sector of the economy. And, and uh, uh, now the farmers, 
in winter so in the summer it was the it was the workers and in the winters it is the farmers that the that the government is harassing and uh, needless to say the work of the farmer is most important in society he or she is contributing to the primary sector of the economy so um, we must say that the government must stop harassing the most important citizens of our societies uh professor nayar your message for international human rights day is professor nayar there has he left or is he there just let me check probably left <laughs> Yeah, I think he has left. Yes, uh, Harman, would you like to say something? If Harman is there, but let me say. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, Harman. Uh, yes, yes. Again, uh, we should say that we have very limited opportunities, uh, like uh, what we celebrate today, because we, as human rights defenders, every day we are having frustrations. We lost our uh, lives, harassment, human rights violations. Many of the things are happening because of our struggles. because of our involvement as sanjay very rightly said about the corporates are buying everyone the uh, rulers uh, the legal system and media and everyone so in that context uh, we are losing everything our struggles but the important thing is we have such very profound important uh, experiences examples like what paul we celebrate today so in that context my uh, humble request to everyone and all the human rights defenders is that let us continue with faith that we will win so we need to continue this struggle without any hesitation because the people like you and me this world is surviving the ancestors the people who brought this knowledge this traditions of protecting mother earth gives us this nature so we are facing cyclones uh, disasters day by day so we just faced one cyclone just two days before and one more coming next few days again because of this destruction of climate and this nature in the name of development so the because of the corporate are gaining people are losing so we in between we need to fight and we continue to fight and this human rights day we recall or remind to everyone so we will never give up we will continue our fight we will win thank you we shall overcome that's it yes paul as as i am kind of uh very much uh, working on the uh, indigenous peoples right and conservation i would like to uh see the uh human rights married to the conservation because uh we've been uh working a lot you know with the indigenous uh, uh groups around the world to really uh push the kind of human rights component into the conservation work so i would like to see in the coming years that uh, there will be uh human rights will be respected in the conservation work especially respecting the rights of the indigenous people and of course we already you know like i have the uh un drifts uh uh kind of um providing the framework for our indigenous people which is the free and proud informed consent so that that that's uh is also there but i need to uh, I, i would like to see more of also uh the human rights components in the conservation work thank you very much and uh, we now come to the close of this one of its kind lively session that has rekindled our hopes for a world where no one is left behind and development justice is within the reach of everyone my sincere thanks once again to paul and to the panelists for their presence today for finding time for us and a special thanks to our audience for their in invaluable contributions for enriching the discussion so bye for now stay safe and stay healthy till we meet again thank you very much
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.